have logic? A tomato can't move. That's what I said. So if he can't move, how's he gonna sit down, George? I was a stand-up tomato, a juicy, sexy beefsteak tomato. Nobody does vegetables like me. I did an evening of vegetables off Broadway. I did the best tomato, the best what? cucumber. I, I did know. an endive salad that knocked the critics on their ass. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film, we explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I am a director, instructor, and in Los Angeles... I am a director, instructor in Los Angeles, California. The thing that people don't know is we're looking at each other as we yeah, record we these things. Yes. And every once in a while I look over at John and I see him listening to me going, oh, Steve's doing it a little differently today. Or at least that's yeah. the expression I saw. Oh, no. and, then, <laughs> and then that started to crack me up. <laughs> Which, of course, you could have just been thinking about something on your phone. Who knows? No, I just loved, loved it was declarative. I am <laughs> a theater and a, I am a, a director. And blah, 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 so I thought that was really cool. Well, you right. read my intention perfectly. It's almost yes. like you were made to analyze performance. It's like it's like your destiny. It is my destiny, Doctor. Can I tell you another thing? Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is the yeah, outlaw Tom Roca. I'm a writer, producer, and host here in San Diego, and uh, someone who is very, very much looking forward to talking about this movie with Steve. And yes, we understand we are two men, but we are also profiling a man who's playing a woman uh, uh, who finds out who people find out later is a man. So. Um, I'm very much looking forward to this one. This one has a lot of connective tissues with me. Rewatching this again for the show as well. Just a lot of stuff about a, a life I left behind a while ago. Um, but also remembering how two screenwriter teachers of my history mm. have told me that this is the tightest script ever written in the history of film. And wow. I'm just blown away by that. So every time I watch it, I'm always like seeing if it's still true you know so i'm excited to dive into this film with you brother well considering how this movie came about calling it the tightest screenplay and i'm not saying that's not true yeah, yeah. Well, it's kind of a miracle and if, in case you haven't guessed or haven't looked at the title or didn't look at the preview or aren't looking at the image associated with this podcast or i can tell you invitation <laughs> i can tell you right now that the film we're talking about is Tootsie, directed by Sidney Pollock, and of course starring Dustin Hoffman and Jessica Lange, and oh, so many people. <laughs> Bill Murray, Gina Davis, Gina, yeah, Gina Davis in her first role. Um, John, how did you first come to Tootsie? You know, I did not, I did not see this one in the theaters. Um, uh, for whatever reason, uh, I think it was, you know, just well, it was odd or whatever. So we rented it, and I remember renting it as a teenager and watching it, and just absolutely blowing away being blown away by it because you know there's a lot of funny comedic moments but it's at that time in my life when i'm really falling in love with actors you know and and the work that they do and the the amount of time they put into creating these characters and i remember this film being something that i absolutely was blown away by and it's not a film i return to many times because there's almost a sense of preciousness or gold about this movie mm. that I always want to preserve every time I watch it. Um, but I did watch it, you know, a lot in the, in the eighties and the nineties. Um, and so I only occasionally revisit it now. Um, and it never loses its joy and it's, it's uh, luster for me. And, you know, for so many reasons. Um, it's funny. I think my story is almost the same. I mm. don't think I saw it in the theater either, which yeah. surprises me because this is exactly the kind of movie that my family would have gone to see in the theater. I, But I do remember sitting with the family in the family room and watching it. I don't yes. remember if it was rented. I don't know if it was Showtime or how it was. And I watched it, you know, a, a fair amount in the 80s and 90s, and I hadn't seen it in forever. Yeah. Um, and it is it's interesting. I, you know, I'll just say this right at the beginning, which is that we're particularly today in a moment where male and female roles and gender identity and stuff is like yeah. really in the forefront. Yeah. And the world was different in 1982 when this was yes. made. And that is what it is, you know, like, and, and so um, looking at it now, I mostly, I think was looking at it with 1980s eyes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I wasn't trying to go, well, how has what we think changed since then as mm -hmm. much, you know? I also think this is a, um, this is a film that belongs in a basket of films from the early 1980s, maybe up to 85, 86, 
where the portrayal of women was changing. Women were yeah. in the workforce. Women are, you know, nine to five, baby boom. Th- those films just kind of really were changing your perception and idea of what it was like for women coming into the workforce. And this film went the next level uh, to show you what women deal with on a daily basis um, from men in the workforce, outside the workforce, and what have you. Um, and I just found it, and, and it was a man playing a woman. So that's the uniqueness of the film, as opposed to Nine to Five or Baby Woman, these other films around this time that kind of explored that this was a man kind of seeing what it's like to be a woman. So we're in a way as men watching him experience the certain things that he's experiencing and learning as we're learning um, what women go through, uh, you know, in these scenes in the film. Well, and it's, it's interesting too, is that I think one of the things you have to keep in mind is what could be groundbreaking at one time, yeah, you know, was. looks passe at another time. So, yeah. so between Kramer versus Kramer, Tootsie and a movie like Mr. Mom, those are all yes. movies where it's like, let's take them. We're going to move the ball forward by taking a man and have it forcing him to experience the role of a woman. Well, today we might go, why is that the role of a woman? And why is a man the lead? You know, like why, yeah. why aren't, you know, but at that time, this was groundbreaking stuff. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and it's funny. It's the, so this started because we started talking about eighties comedies. And so we just finished doing Beverly Hills cop, Beverly Hills cop had sort of two parallel origin stories with some stuff going on with Michael Eisner and some stuff going on with Simpson and Bruckheimer that, mm-hmm. that merged together. This is the same thing. Two separate origin stories, the first of which is in the late 70s. This is when things like, you know, a transitioning, you know, there was uh, uh, Renee Richards, who is a man who transitioned to a woman and became a tennis player or what already was a tennis player. And Dustin Hoffman and his friend Murray Chagall were fascinated with this idea. And so Mm. that they started off going, we want to do a movie where Dustin dresses up as a woman and probably as a tennis player. And that's in the late 70s that this is happening. Um, at the same time, an, a writer named Don McGuire wrote a play about an actor who dresses up as a woman to get a gig. And that is bought by Charles Evans, who is the brother of Robert Evans. <laughs> and so these, both of these things are happening. So we have Dustin Hoffman and his playwriting buddy, Maury Chagall trying to figure out how to do this tennis player story. Yeah. And we have this script from Don McGuire bought by Charles Evans. Yeah. And, you know, you said this is the tightest screenplay ever written, and you are about to hear the craziest development process you could possibly imagine. Okay. Um, the play from Don McGuire with Charles Evans, they bring in Dick Richards to direct. The title is Paging Donna Darling. <laughs> um, and it starts out, it's a down and out actor who's working in a drag club. And there are elements from that script that re- remain in the final movie, including... Among the most famous lines were, you know, let's try to make her pretty. How far can you pull back? How do you feel about Cleveland? Oh, that line is the best. So that is in the very, the original play. (laughs) And the actor uh, signed to play the agent is Buddy Hackett. And (laughs) the actor to play the lead is George Hamilton. Oh, wow. What an interesting combo. Yep. I can Uh, see it. That's a perfect 1980s cast. It's it, 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 but it, but it's so a comedy. Do you know what yes. I mean? Oh, like yeah, George Hamilton so. and Buddy Hackett. That's just a comedy. Um, and then uh, Hamilton falls out, and they offer it to Peter Sellers. Oh, wow! And then they offer it to Michael Caine. <laughs> um, and now what you're about to hear is a ton of. There are more writers that worked on this script than I have all the. I don't have everyone's name. Wow! The next writer that comes in is a TV writer, Robert Kaufman, who wrote. Uh, a whole bunch of TV comedy. He also wrote classic films like the happy hooker goes to Washington. Yes. <laughs> do you remember the happy hooker series? I do remember the happy hooker. Yes. Yeah. I was going through puberty in the eighties and had sure. show time. So I also sure. remember the happy hooker series. <laughs> he also direct, and this is maybe where the George Hamilton connection is. Cause he wrote love at first bite. Oh yeah. Which I love. And then that is where suddenly Dustin Hoffman comes on because Charlie Evans, brother with Bob Evans, yeah. Bob Evans is buddies with Dustin Hoffman, tells Dustin Hoffman, hey, my brother is working on this actor dressing up as a woman thing. And Dustin goes, I've been trying to do a me dressing drag thing for 
seven years. Wow. And they go, oh, we'll check this out. So now Dustin Hoffman's on. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman seems like a lot of a lot. This is what we discover now in retrospect when you read all the articles and certainly some of the uncomfortable stuff that is said about him and that he did. And certainly the 70s, 80s actors, you look at through, through them with 2022 20, eyes and it, they, their behavior can be quite uncomfortable. Pacino slapping Diane Keaton. Uh, Hoffman slapping uh, Meryl Streep for real in those scenes in Kramer vs. Kramer. So, but the thing you hear about is that he was one of the most difficult actors to work with. Um, and I remember seeing the movie with that mentality in mind uh, at some point in my life. And every time I see the movie now, it's almost like somewhat of a biography of Dustin Hoffman. He had become kind of like Richard Dreyfus, like others, uh, getting this reputation of very, very difficult to work with. It absolutely is. It's so much that's fueled. And, and, and what's so funny is like, I kind of on the, you can't argue with results. It's right. like Dustin yes. Hoffman's demanding nature yeah. and pressure and insanity is in this movie. It is yeah. both part of, you know, the discipline to make the movie really good, but it's also literally in the movie in that scenes in the movie are inspired by Dustin Hoffman feet <laughs> of pain in the ass. Um, and by the way, uh, he just came off of Kramer versus Kramer and, oh. and he was really in this place in his life where he was fascinated at looking at the other side of what was it like. And, and there's some stuff about Dustin Hoffman that I think we'll get into as we go along. Sure. But one thing about him is his passion and his rawness at the surface of it. That's just who he is. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so one of the first things to do, the first thing is, well, can we dress me up as a woman? And so they do, they don't even have a script. I mean, they, you know, they've thrown out like 12 scripts and they go, well, let's do a screen test. So they dress him up as a woman and they film him. He looks at himself in a mirror and he says, hey, can we do this again? Because I kind of want to be an attractive woman. Which is in the movie. And and they basically tell him, listen, Dustin, this is as pretty as we can make you. <laughs> How far back do you want it to pull back? <laughs> it's how do you feel about Cleveland? And, and what's interesting, because I've seen some of the early screen tests, they actually did make him much prettier. They, 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 it, yeah. it was a long process to figure out how to do this. But yeah. this was, it sounds like them saying this is as pretty as we can make you was a shattering experience for Dustin Hoffman. And he says... He, th and I have a really long quote, which I'll, I'll sort of edit a little bit, but he said, it was at that moment I had an epiphany and I went home and started crying. He started talking to his wife and his wife is like, what's going on? What's the problem? He says, he says, well, because I think I'm an interesting woman, which is an interesting statement from the beginning. And he says, but when I look at myself on my screen, I know that if I met myself at a party, I would never talk to myself. Yeah. He says, because she doesn't fulfill physically the demands that we're brought up to think a woman has to have in order to ask them out. And he goes on to say, I have, this is why I have to make this movie. Because there's too many interesting women that I have not had the experience to know in my life because I've been brainwashed. Yeah. So, and, and this is the thing, because <laughs> we'll get to it, but Dustin Hoffman in many ways is a problematic person. He's a confusing person. You know, yeah. He's human. You can, yeah. you can reduce it all the way back down to him being a human, but there's a lot of conflicting ideologies in the movie and a lot of conflicting ideologies in Hoffman because he's basically saying, because I didn't find her attractive, I needed to make this movie to right. champion these women. But women, but men do find those women attractive. It's just not your kind of man that finds her attractive. So you find a little bit of uh, shallowness in that motivation to make, even though he's coming from a place of wanting to give these women a voice and a um, and a platform to be showcased, because certainly in Hollywood they weren't casting many women like this to be leads in a movie. No, for sure. yeah, not even leads in soap operas. Yeah, right. Yes, very good point. So now we've had uh, several different writers. Those writers are out, and Maury Chagall, who is the guy that Dustin Hoffman has been working with, comes in, and he writes. Maybe he writes draft three and four. But he's also going to write draft seven and eight because what happens is that writers get fired from this thing and then they're going to come back on later, which is I can't imagine that experience of being rehired to rewrite my work that has been rewritten by somebody else. Let me ask you something. They must have believed in this movie. They have so oh, yeah. I mean, because you're you're paying out so much money to these writers. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not 500 bucks to do a pass on a script from, from a studio in Hollywood. It's a lot of money when they give you when they ask you to take a pass and, and do whatever. It's it's some thousands of dollars. So 
they clearly must have believed in this concept at some level to keep trying and trying and trying and trying to get this thing right. So now at this point, even though Maury Chagall is, that's Dustin Hoffman's buddy, yeah. they're still not happy with the script. And so he gets fired and in they bring in the great Larry Gelbart. Ah, and, yes, of course. And Larry Gelbart, who we last talked about when we talked about Oh God from the show Shows, creator of the TV show of MASH, one of the great witty writers of all time. <laughs> this is how he describes it. Because, you know, if you're a well-known screenwriter, you get handed scripts to fix. Yeah. That's, that's one of the gigs. And he says... Uh, it's a maxim in Hollywood that six scripts are delivered at a much faster pace than the money one is paid to make them well. <laughs> um, so Gilbert basically goes, look, I'm not interested in doing a comedy about a guy in drag. He said, you know, he's like, first of all, some like it hot already did it better than anybody else is ever going to do it. Great point. Um, and he said, I did, I wrote for six years or however long he was in charge of mash. I wrote clinger for a long time. Right. Right. I've done tons and tons of men dressing up as women jokes all the way back to your show of shows. I'm not interested in that. What he said he was interested in is what might a man learn from being a woman? Yeah. Yeah. Now what's interesting about this though, is that Dustin Hoffman in his interviews say that was Maury Chagall's idea. Ooh. So, and this is what, you know, we can't trace yeah, yeah, yeah. who came up with what, and maybe they both had this thought. Welcome so back. now we've got Larry Gelbart meeting with Dustin Hoffman every day, he says, for a year and a half. Wow. And, uh, and by the way, his description of Dustin Hoffman is he described him as stimulating, sometimes <laughs> far too stimulating. <laughs> Is that Dustin Hoffman is just like ideas from here and there and here and there. And they're all over the place. And some of them are brilliant and some of them are crazy. And then they would argue about them. He he was like, you know, with the most, maybe six months of it, they weren't even writing anything. Wow. They were just meeting every day, talking about women and talking about acting and talking about soap operas and talking about relationships and how men, you know, and, and, and Dustin Hoffman going crazy and Larry Gelbart trying to take notes. And at this point, they bring in a director who also starts meeting with them on a daily basis. And that director is Hal Ashby. Oh, wow. Yeah. On the last detail. Right. Yep. Last detail being there. Um, so now Hal Ashby is in there. Larry Gelbart describes this situation as Ashby was on a different wavelength. <laughs> <laughs> That's the perfect way to describe <laughs> Hal Ashby, period. <laughs> yeah. Period. Yeah. Which I mean, and to be clear, and I think we mentioned this when we talked about being there, Hal Ashby was high all the time. Yep. 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 Guy and smoked sadly, a lot. Yeah, and sadly passed away very early before people could really grasp what a great director he was. Yeah. So and again, I have two stories. They mm -hmm. might both be true. New neither might be true. One might be true. One story is that in the end, Dustin Hoffman was sick of Hal Ashby and he was fired off the project. <laughs> the other story is that Columbia. Hal Ashby had a deal with Hal Ashby and he was still finishing post on another picture and hadn't finished it. And so they pulled him off the project. Oh, okay. So I don't know which is true or both could right. be true. Who knows? Um, and so now they bring in Sidney Pollack. Yeah. Sidney Pollack had never directed a comedy. Didn't think of himself as a comedy oh, director. Right. Yeah. He had just done, you know, the, the, the other Sidney Pollack movie we did is Three Days of the Condor. Yeah, Three Days of the Condor. You know, he had done serious movies. And and so what he said, uh, he he basically went, I can't approach this as a comedy. My only way to approach this is as a serious movie. Right. Um, and that really is how they went forward, is that it's not that they didn't know it was funny, is that they were never, ever going for jokes. Yeah. And again, we go back to this idea of refocusing on, and this is how uh, Maury Chagall said it, mm. this is the story of a man who becomes a better man by becoming a woman. Yeah. Which is a really good, and, and Sidney Pollock's like, that's what it is. Yep. Now it's Sidney Pollock, Larry Gelbart, and Dustin Hoffman meeting every day. That's some strong lines. That's some strong lines, yeah. And, and then Dustin's like, this is not enough. We need to actually like have a week isolated together. So CAA, who represents all three of them, arranges <laughs> for a place in Connecticut for them to have a week locked in a room together. Wow. And... Larry Gilbert, it seems like maybe he had a family commitment or maybe he just mm -hmm. didn't want to be locked in a room for a week <laughs> with That's Dustin fine. Hoffman. Yeah. So he said, look, I can't make it. And what Larry Gilbert says is from that point forward, Hoffman and his relationship was soured. 
Oh, wow. Like Hoffman said, like, it's like everything I say is poison and Larry Gelbart won't listen to anything I say. Hmm. So now Larry Gelbart is fired. <laughs> so we, we've already had many, many writers. We've been developing this thing for years. And it's funny, you and I just did a short and we were talking about Dr. Strange yeah. and we were talking about the Wanda character and you had said, well, they all, you know, it was all male writers and they should have brought in a female writer. And I push back a bit and still believe like, look, writers can write for different kinds of people. But, and this is where I'm more on your team at this point is that here we've had a movie where the whole center point of the movie yeah. is what can a man learn from living as a woman and what is life like for a woman? Have there been any women working on this project? Nope. Nobody. That's the hubris of men. Yep. Yeah. And so at this point, they bring in, again, I will say, the great Elaine May. Oh, see, that should have been it from the beginning. Yep. Yeah. And I'll say this. So so the way, the way um, credits for movies work is that yeah. in a movie like this, where you have 19 different writers, I think it's 11 writers actually worked yeah. on this movie. Uh, is it goes to the WGA and the WGA reviews all of the scripts, all the drafts, all the notes. And then they say, here's who gets credit. Right. Elaine May was not given credit on this script. And I think from what I understand, and of course, there's no way for me to pull apart what really happened. Right. She deserves a lot of credit for what happened. Surprise. Bill Murray character is Elaine May's. Um, oh. Sandy is Elaine May. Oh, wow. uh, she brought her in a lot of the stuff with Julie. And her character, that's all Elaine May. Well, it's just like, um, what, when Harry met Sally? Exactly. Right? I mean, um, Nora Ephron coming in and, and doing all that. I mean, I'm telling you, I, I, people may not agree with me, and I don't care, and you can find the occasional example when they've got it right. But if you're writing about women, you should absolutely have a fucking woman in the room. Absolutely. in the room. And not even as, like, one of the staff. Like, it should be absolutely, if you're going to write female characters, because – you fucking don't know the intrinsic nature of a woman. You're a man. You cannot fucking know it. Even if you watch this movie, you cannot know it. Really, bone deep. Women know it. And it's those little things that women know and can, that can add authenticity to a scene that can elevate your project. And so I'll always be in a camp. Same thing. When I see white writers try to write for people of color, you don't fucking get it. You don't. You have no concept of what you're talking about. And so to me... This is where I think it's really important. You know, it doesn't mean they have to be the main writer, but certainly they should be involved in the process and in in, in a strong way. So, you know, no surprise. So, and and if you're going to go bring a woman in, Elaine May, Elaine May. Is, is, a, is a perfect choice, man. Yeah. Yeah. And again, this is where I'll, I'll push back a little bit because while I agree with your basic point is mm -hmm. there are lots of great things written. A lot of things are written by one person. Mo most things are mm -hmm. written you know, it's like I wouldn't go to Edward Albee and say, listen, this who's afraid of Virginia Woolf thing. I think you really need a woman to write Martha's part. You know what I mean? Like that's like. But I can probably name you 50 other playwrights who can't get women right for that one. Of course. Edward absolutely. Edward that's, and that's the thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and th and this is the, you know, but, you know, this is where we, you know, we, and we could do a whole short on. Oh, this sure. Of course. Of course. It's, it's, it's like part of being a yeah. best writer ever wrote yeah. incredible women in his play. Well, yeah, yeah. And part of being a writer is that like you, you can't all your characters can't be you, mm. you know, you have to write people like George Lucas actually had never been to space when he wrote alien. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, like, but uh, Carrie Fisher had to write, rewrite her dialogue. You know? Actually, you're right. That yeah. was a poor example. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with George Lucas was not that he hadn't been to space. It's that he hadn't actually interacted with humans. With human beings. Yeah. Ask, uh, ask Nally Portman how he feels about her writing. His writing. Um, uh, so Elaine yeah. May comes in. She brought obviously a, a tremendous amount to it. Um, and then there's several other writers co that come in, including Barry Levinson was a writer on this at wow. one point. And there are several other people whose names I didn't know. Larry Gelbart calls up Sidney Pollack at a certain point and says, listen, here's some writer. Who's this writer? I've never even heard this name that's now writing on the script. And, and Sidney Pollack said, listen, Larry, don't worry. They're not really writing so much as stitching scenes together. And Larry Gelbart says, okay, can you, re can you refer to them from now on as a seamstress instead of a screenwriter? <laughs> so, and at this point, it's still, now it's still Hoffman and Pollock mm -hmm. meeting every day and they are tooth and nail and now at each other. Yeah. At each other yes. And Sidney Pollock has his writers that he's brought on. Dustin Hoffman brings back Maury Chagall. And so each one of them are meeting, arguing, 
going to their writers, having their writers write scenes, <laughs> bringing those scenes in, arguing about them. Yeah. And, and what ends up happening is it's that it's literally like a line from Larry Gelbart to a line from Maury Chagall responded to by Elaine May. Like they're just taking little pieces from all these different scripts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and this is why, and again, I'm not arguing that this might be the tightest script of all time. Right. But the way they got there is totally insane, including that Larry Gelbart was rehired at the end at draft 12 or something to do more rewrites. Yeah. Well, I mean, tightest script, however you get there is however you get yep. there. It's the tightest script. And I think it would be, I think it's actually, it makes sense that it gone, it, that it went through so many um, iterations before it landed on, on the final iteration. And the fact that it was, because you had so many talented people working on it, they were able to hone it and shape it and cut off, cut off the excess fat and deliver a pretty lean, uh, mean script. So that's a good thing. And and this includes every day on the set. Yeah, every day well, on the set seems to start with an argument with Dustin Hoffman and Sidney Pollock. And, and and here's so and then here's the Hollywood description of that Dustin Hoffman felt the need to fight with every single director. But once he what figured out, once everything was figured out, he was quote unquote a pleasure to work with. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as much as we give directors guff on this show, and we have in the past for multiple takes or um, you know abusive behavior or whatever, it got to be fair and give it to the actors too. And you know, someone like Hoffman, I don't know, watching the scenes with him in the movie can be quite frustrating as a as a as you know as a former actor, and it just is. And if he was that way on sets, I, I would go insane. But then again, like you said, you can't argue with the results because that's his process, kind of like McEnroe. It's a very New York process. I got to pick a fight to dial myself into the match, and then I can deliver my great performance. You know, I uh, yeah, I I I I'm the same. I can't argue with success. I also would hate don't want to work that way. You oh know what God. I mean? You would go insane with some. Oh. Like, oh. Well, and and I just think about the 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 patience of Sidney Pollock yeah, to yeah, deal yeah. with what he dealt with in this movie. And because and, the other thing is in the end, the director's got to be the person who points in the direction and says yeah, yeah, this yeah. is where we're going. And yeah. to take all of that chaos and he managed to point the right way. Yeah. That's pretty damn amazing. Well you know? and at some at some level Hoffman must respect him enough to let him point that way as well and go along with it. You know? Well and, and by the way, and, and spoiler alert, this is why Sidney Pollock plays the agent in yeah. the movie. Because Dustin Hoffman went, this is us every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I can be acting here. <laughs> um, so speaking of which, would you like to get into Tootsie? Yes, 25 minutes later. Let's do this. Let's get into Tootsie. Um, this montage, this was really, this was never in the script. This was something that was oh. created because Sidney Pollack went, I, we need to find a way to get to the heart of the movie visually at the beginning. Mm. And so we, what we have is three different things stitched together. One of which is Dustin Hoffman putting on makeup. Yeah. And par because part of this is what is the job of an actor to transform into somebody else? Yeah. And this whole movie is about the process of transformation and the external and the internal and how changing the external changes the internal and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so that we see right at the beginning. And why is he putting on makeup and getting dressed? What is he going off to do? auditions um or to play in the uh, uh tolstoy play but yeah all these different things but he's also teaching mm -hmm. um and auditioning and working at the restaurant so this montage is a great window into a working actor's life uh and i think it's a it's it's a fantastic way to begin to introduce you to the character did the auditions give you any uh, PTSD? Oh, my God. The whole film gives me PTSD. Are you kidding? That's why I can't watch Barry. I mean, I love Barry, and I love to watch Barry. But every time I watch Barry, I have such PTSD from being in those acting classes, from doing those exercises, from doing all that nonsense. And I get it. Look, if I was to teach acting, and I have really thought about it many, many times, um, I would get rid of all that shit. Authenticity is the key. Find the authenticity in a person have them bring that out in a character all that you know look in my eyes let me mirror your face mirror what you're doing that's all stuff to maybe get you out of your uh, comfort zone but the real thing you're trying to get to is authenticity when people sense authenticity whether on the screen or on the stage that's where great acting happens and that's where people get moved 
And so um, watching those scenes were just <laughs> brings me to the worst times in acting. class. I hated doing all that nonsense. I really, you do. know, you know, what's funny when I asked you about PTSD, my expectation was that you were going to talk about the auditions, not about <laughs> the acting classes, but in fact, I totally know what you're talking about. I yeah. have been in those acting classes too. Yeah. But, they're painful sometimes they are and auditions are you know the auditions of the p i don't really have ptsd from auditions because you know you, you, the job is to go in there and do your best and get out the the transition between commercial and theater and um all of that it, there's so little you control that, that if you really put a lot of effort into the odd and i'm sorry put a lot of meaning into the audition you're going to go insane it's a matter of when booking the room. Will you get the role? Who knows? But book the room. That's really the, the thing you're trying to do more than anything else. So, yeah. Well, and one of the key things that's happening is even though in these auditions, there are funny things happening with him going, no, I could be taller. No, I could be shorter. I could be different. I could be older. Yeah. I could be younger. I know, but I'm really, we're looking for somebody different. I can be different. We're looking for somebody else, okay? That's all funny, but it's all true. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. Like, there's nothing in these auditions that are exaggerated. This is how they are. Right. You know, including him doing his best monologue, which I think is from the Kane Mutiny, maybe. So when all hell broke loose and the Germans started running out of soap and figured, what the hell, we might as well cook up Mrs. Greenwald. Who the hell do you think stopped them? Pardon me, but is my acting interfering with your talking? I was at an audition because uh, yeah. Karen was casting something and I was running camera and the director was there and the person was auditioning and it was even a friend of ours who was yeah. auditioning Ooh. and the director took a phone call in the midst of her audition. Yeah. That's so messed up. I had that with Jeff Greenberg over at NBC, that son of a bitch. He, I went into audition for Modern Family and so Shannon's probably listening and going, oh my God, don't say that about Jeff Greenberg. Well, fuck it. I'm not doing it anymore. So I don't care. But I was there to, and I was literally in front of his desk, not even at a, on a stage or in a room. I was in front of his desk, which is so intimidating. And I did the, and that motherfucker halfway through just started reading his emails or started doing something else. And when I was done, I was like, uh, and he didn't even know I was done when I was done. And then he looked over, he's like, okay, thanks. And I was like, do you want, do you have any adjustments or anything? Uh, yeah, you could try it again like this. And then I tried it again. And he wasn't even paying attention. He was looking down and looking at his emails. And I'm just like, yeah, fuck off, man. And that was the moment. Those are those, those, those little things that you, when they're like that in an audition, I just want to, I just want to fucking, you know, go ape shit because yeah. we get treated like so nothing. And yet people get mad when actors have 26 page writers or they're, uh, to me, I understand it now in different ways, having been through it. And people who've never been through it, you don't fucking know what it's like to have your uh, humanity erased <laughs> in like oh, yeah. 30 seconds or two minutes. And so when people have those 20 I don't, I don't have an issue with that because I just go, yeah, you know what? Earn your shit. Earn your shit. Now, if you treat people badly, that I have an issue with. But getting as much out of the studio as you can or the directors you can, that I don't have a problem with, you know? I Yeah, I, I, I feel the same. It's It's... The problem is, is some of those writers affect ordinary people mm. that are not the studio. You know what I mean? Because the, the guy yeah, who's yeah. going to have to go pick up the the exact right uh, Green leanly cut roast beef is a PA. <laughs> and he's going to get yelled at because he didn't fulfill the thing that the ridiculous thing on the writer. What um, is this? I, is this boar's head or is this not boar's head? Yeah, yeah. I request very clear. Um, I was doing an audition. This is when I was uh, in theater. And as I think, you know, like I was never cast in anything originally. Yeah. I was always somebody left the show and I, I guess Steve could do it. And that's how I got cast in things. So there was a play and I needed to come in and audition for one of the professors at Cal because he was directing oh, the play. Right. And in my mom, so I'm doing a monologue in this guy's office and in my monologue, which was a ridiculous monologue, I start to choke myself. Right. So I'm like choking myself and the guy's phone rings and he answers the phone and I have my hands around my own neck mid and it's like a really emotional monologue and i'm going like do i stop <laughs> you know <laughs> unless someone's dying answering the phone is a real asshole move from anybody i don't give a fuck what level you're at it's an asshole move man no i mean because sometimes when you're auditioning it's vulnerable it's yeah, not it just it's like i mean and i don't even mean just it's always vulnerable but right. sometimes you're actually performing something that's really personal yeah, yeah you yeah. know 
Yeah. Um, and you have to access some emotions and to be disrespected in that moment is terrible. Well, and that's why I think Terry Gar's character is really the character that is the actor in terms of not the do- not the uh, Dustin Hoffman version of the actor, but the regular version of the actor. Yeah. Who's always struggling, who's always questioning themselves, who always wants to leave back and go home and do something else, uh, but loves it so much that they stay doing it for, yeah. uh, you know, in their lives and go to the classes and do all those things. She's so she's such a great light in the movie, man. I, I love I loved her even more watching it this time. To be honest, I, I I totally agree. And and by the way, the acting class it's interesting because both Dustin Hoffman and Sidney Pollock taught acting because <laughs> Sidney Pollock's an actor. I mean, that's where he yeah, yeah. comes he from. Yes. Yeah, and then he became he became a director through being an acting coach. And Dustin Hoffman taught acting in the decade where he was an auditioning actor, yeah. desperately trying to get work. And so what they did was they just assembled an acting class. And so this really is Dustin Hoffman teaching an acting class. Yeah, it feels very natural. You can tell. Well, and they wanted to show that this guy is passionate and mm-hmm. intense. But somebody writes a play. They decide where the highs are, where the lows are, right? Now you do it. And you may not be high where they're high in the writing. You may not be low where they're low in the writing. You may be high on butt. You may be high on and. And all of that is just him teaching. That's all improvised stuff. Yeah, and I think that's what was great about the opening of the movie is that you get a real window into... This guy is actually good at what he does, but you know, you find out later, he's also difficult to work with in that Tolstoy scene, but he's yep. the things, the things he's imparting are actually good lessons. Yeah. Well, and we should say what this Tolstoy scene is, which is apparently he's cast in a play pair, playing aging Tolstoy and he's having his death scene. And the director <laughs> says, that's super Michael, but I wonder if you could move center stage on that last speech and then die. Why? The left side of the house can't see you at all. You want me to stand up and walk to the center of the stage while I'm dying? <laughs> <laughs> but what's great here, real quick, is the exasperation of the director because he's probably been work- dealing with this shit every day from uh, from uh, Dustin Hoffman's from Michael. So, you know, it, it's perfect, his frustration. Like, oh, well, yet again, I've got to explain. Don't you get it? You know? Well, and that is actually a perfectly good point because Michael's objection to getting up and walking across the room while he's dying, that is a reasonable actor's it's objection. A valid objection, absolutely. But if he was objecting to every single fucking thing, yeah. it doesn't matter. And it's funny. Uh, I have a very close friend who had very, very contentious relationships with directors, and now he just turned 60, and he yeah. went, oh, my God, I was a terrible not not that the directors were always great people but he was he's like he spent his young years just looking for a fight because he knew yeah. he was right does he does you know? he listen to the show uh no i don't think so. oh okay you should send him this episode <laughs> don't apologize now it's too late it's too late yeah you, yeah you were a mercurial actor uh and people loved you for that so that was the exchange and this contrast between just the total helplessness of him auditioning and the passionate intensity of him teaching is really key to the movie. Yes, it's it's why you're like at times horrified by him, but also championing him in, in, in the movie. You're an actor. You're in New York City. There's no work, but you've got to find ways to work. And where does he find work? Cut to working as a waiter. I love that. I love that because they start out sh- showing him as this kind of like, you know, paragon of acting and he defends acting and he's teaching these people. And, he's, and it feels like, OK, he's a he's ahead of everybody else. He's a lead dog. And then you see him. Nope. He's a waiter just like everybody else, you know, doing yep. his thing. So I love that. It's a great way to make him connectable as kind of a blue collar guy to the audience, even though he's in the arts. Um, and who is working at the restaurant with him? But Bill Murray. Uh, this is so, I think this is actually the beginning of Bill Murray, the actor. Yeah. Yeah. Rather than just Bill Murray, the really funny guy. I would argue this is his most relaxed performance ever, ever. Just I, so easy in this whole film. It's great. Certainly it is of the first 15 to 20 years. You know what yeah, I mean? His, his humanity is here in certain moments. Like yeah. his genuine humanity is, you can glimpse Bill Murray behind the veneer in certain moments here in this movie. Yeah. Um, and they're walking home and they're talking about the necktie scene, which is because <laughs> we discovered that, that his character, Jeff is a playwright. The necktie. the necktie is what's wrong with your play. 
Okay. You take the neck out, place. you got something. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with me? I'll tell you what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me, it is very depressing to be disagreed with. <laughs> that line says a lot. <laughs> Yeah, because if you think you're the smartest person in the room, it's the hardest thing in the world to be disagreed with, even though you like to disagree with everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> well, and this is I'll tell you the biggest revelation I had watching this movie this time. Mm. I knew that he was a flawed character. I remembered that. Yeah. I didn't remember just how flawed. He <laughs> yes. Was. Yeah. He is. <laughs> he is not a good guy in certain moments. It, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and what I love, too, is that Jeff, the playwright likes that as a line you know what i mean like he's because i this is this is what hanging out with me is like sometimes so it's like because the always observing you know <laughs> it's like oh that's interesting i should make a note of that uh and now how did this character come to be well this character was created by elaine may ah yeah. it's elaine may who decided that he should have a roommate and dustin was totally against it he said look i'm a man in my 40s men in their 40s don't have a roommate they might live with a woman or they live alone. They don't live with another guy. And Elaine's like, nope, you have a roommate. You have to have a male roommate, she said, because that's your shadow. She's like, you need to have the Greek chorus. You have to have someone to witness all the craziness yeah, and to comment on it. You need someone to talk to. Otherwise, you're all alone. Um, and I think that is critical to the movie. Mm -hmm. And then Bill Murray was Dustin Hoffman's idea. Oh, to cast him. Oh, to cast him. Because they had met at, you know, some Saturday Night Live parties or something and hung out together. And Bill basically cast him before telling Sidney Pollack. He just went, do you want to be in this movie and play my roommate? And Bill was like, yeah, okay, that sounds like fun. <laughs> and then Sidney Pollack, was, had, it, it, this is what he says. He says he never watched Saturday Night Live. Oh, yeah. So he didn't, he just knew that this guy was a comedian. He didn't know anything about him, didn't know if he could act. Right. Uh, and listening to the commentary track, Sidney Pollack, is continuously impressed with Bill Murray. Wow. He thinks he's amazing. What? So they're heading upstairs to the apartment. Instead of trying to be Michael Dorsey, the great actor, or Michael Dorsey, the great waiter, why don't you just try to be Michael Dorsey? And they're walking inside and he's repeating, I am Michael Dorsey, I am Michael <laughs> Dorsey. <laughs> and then they walk through the door and... Surprise! He's having a big surprise party. Right. And there is Terry Garr, who makes a toast. <laughs> to Michael, um, who's been my friend for six years. Oh, was it that long? And who's my coach, and he's just great. He's a great coach, he's a great actor, he's a great guy, and this is a really dumb speech. <laughs> Let's get drunk. Happy birthday! <laughs> Again, just so natural in the movie. She's great. And Elaine May says she wrote this part for Terry Garr. Oh, perfect. And Terry Gar says when she heard the part had been written to her, she wanted to turn it down. <laughs> Why? Because she says, well, then I don't want it. What's the point of, of then it's just oh. me acting like me. I want to be other people. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. Um, this is also a case of it is it is a run down apartment, but it is a huge apartment. <laughs> it's an expansive apartment. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Oh, my God. Now we're going to intercut. Uh, Bill Murray's character, who is pontificating to a group, which will grow smaller and smaller. Yes. And Dustin Hoffman's character, who is coming on to one woman after another. All right, how you doing? I'm Michael. Michael, Patty. Are you Patty. an actress? You have a terrific face. Yeah. What's a nice blouse? Who would you come here with? Uh, you know, it's a great window to another. I know the opening is a great window to him as a, as a person in terms of as a professional, right? But this is a great window into him as a person, right? He is clearly desperately in need of the stroke and by that oh, yeah. i mean some you know him sleeping and as someone who's been through this i understand it you know him trying to hit on every woman him trying to sleep with every woman like the, and the fact is they're not even real to him the fact that he no. doesn't remember he asked for the number of one of the girls uh one of the women rather uh, near the end of the party who says she gave it to him already and all of that like he and he tries to play it off. oh did it change from an hour ago all of that. And then, of course, Christine Ebersole is one of the women that he's hitting on, who's a fantastic actress, Broadway actress. And she leaves with someone else. You know, there goes Ms. Wright. I think it just shows how empty he is inside. Like, he's just needing some sort of satisfaction. And he's trying to find it in all these places that aren't really the stroke that he wants. They're just the stroke that he gets for now. Because what he wants is validation for his talent in a large-scale format. 
uh, right. and getting it as an, as an acting coach, getting it by sleeping with these women, they're minor temporary victories of feeling good about yourself. But in the end, he's back to being hollow again, you know? Yep. Yep. I think that is, I think that is a perfect diagnosis of this guy. Mm-hmm. It's, he wants validation on every single level and he is so shallow in his approach to getting it. You guys might not believe this. I slept with a lot of women in my twenties and thirties. And it was just like, you know, uh, it was a thing. And, but all of that was so empty because I was looking for, I was claiming to look for something more solid, but I didn't understand that there was a lot of shit going on inside of me that I had to come to terms with before I could open the door to actually have an adult mature relationship. And so, it, you know, those things happen. So if any of you who are listening are doing this, stop it, go do some therapy, figure things out. And trust me, you'll have much more fulfilling relationships. So. Um, I'll make this as quick a digression as I possibly can, but th- there's an incredible book called Girls in Sex, mm. which is this woman who interviewed young women from like, you know, 11 or 12 through college age about what it was like growing up. And it was a super honest book and it's very unsurprisingly depressing in yeah. terms of uh, like, you know, the Instagram and s- sense of self-worth and yeah, you know, yeah. relationships oh, God, and, yes. and binge drinking in college and date rape. And it's really upsetting. And then she wrote a book called Boys and Sex, which is the same thing. It came out five or six years later. And I expected it to be, to make me really, really angry. And what yeah. ended up happening, it made me so sad because they have all these guys in college and everything is about getting laid and one night yeah. stands and a lot of drinking and all this stuff. And there was at least five college age guys who came to her and said, look, I'm just so lonely and I have sex all the time, but I want someone to love me. And, but that's not cool in my fraternity. You right. know what I mean? And so, and, and I just don't know how to form these. And I was like, Oh my God, this is so sad. <laughs> yeah. Um, It's one of the big reasons I left my fraternity. The pressure there to try to sleep with as many women as possible when I was looking for a relationship was overwhelming. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's doesn't excuse. And, and you know what, it may be a symptom and we're not, you know, sociologists, but it may be a symptom of how date rape in these situations happen is because of this pressure that men put on other men to sleep with women, to achieve some level of status. That is an illusion, an absolute illusion, man. Well, of course it is. And I, I think we are, you're right. We are not qualified sociologists or psychologists, yeah, yeah. but I'm completely agreeing with you. And I think it is a, also a symptom of the dehumanization of women yes. and objectification of women, which is how we see um, Michael's, Dustin Hoffman's character, yeah. treating women in this scene. Yes. Is, the, is the fact that he has the same bullshit that he lays out on each one, doesn't actually remember who they are as humans. That is part of that thing, you know? Absolutely. And even in there's one moment, again, it's a small plant, but it's an important plant is there's Sandy sees this guy with a baby and tries to introduce Michael to the baby. And he has no interest oh, at all. He could care less. Here's how the Bill Murray stuff happened. City Pollock just went to Bill and said, hey, Bill, can you come up with something that sounds almost profoundly true when you first hear it? But the more you think about it, the more you realize it's nonsense. And Bill Murray says, yeah, sure, I can do that. <laughs> and all of this is all of this stuff is improvised. I don't want a full house at the Winter Garden Theater. I want 90 people who just came out of the worst rainstorm in the city's history. These are people who are alive on the planet until they dry off. <laughs> There's also a moment where uh Terry Gar goes to Sidney Pollock and says, Listen, Sydney, can you just shoot the, this bathroom door? I have a thing I want to do. And Sydney's like, well, what are you going to do? She says, just, just set up the camera and the lights and let me, let me do a thing, which is crazy to do on the set because setting up the camera and the lights to shoot, that could have been an hour or two oh, yeah. of setup that Sydney doesn't know what she's, but he does it. And then she does this <laughs> popping out of the bathroom and says, oh, God. Did anybody hear me? I've been trapped in that bathroom for a half an hour. What kind of a party is this? You guys are having a good time, huh? Mm-hmm. Sorry. I'll have to remember that if I ever do a scene where I'm trapped someplace, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Sandy is such a... Yeah. She, you're, I, I'm going with... She is so real. Yeah. 100% real. There's no... Yeah. There's, she's not hiding a thing. She's just so... Everything you need to know about Sandy is right there. You know? It's great. And the party is kind of winding down. As you said, one of the women that Dustin Hoffman came on to has left with another guy. 
And Terry Gar is still there. And what we realize is that this is one of his really close friends, in addition to being his acting student. And she says, Well, good night, Michael. It was a wonderful party. My date left with someone else. I had a lot of fun. Do you have any second off? <laughs> it's got to be an Elaine May line. I think so. Come on, I'll take you on. This is just like one little walking shot. Apparently, Dustin Hoffman was not happy with it, and they did it over and over oh. and over and over again. I did have a good time. I really did. Oh, you did. Yes, I did. Bring enough money for camp. That's okay. It's cheaper to get mugged. <laughs> so Sandy's really broke. This is, you know, like really broke. Yeah, she is. And then she just burst into tears. What's wrong? Nothing, Swan. What? Nothing. I'm nothing. I just, I'm perfectly fine. She doesn't say nothing's wrong. Mm -hmm. She says, I'm nothing. Yeah. You're worried about your audition tomorrow, aren't you? No, I'm not no? worried about that audition. Why? Because Why I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to get it. Because I'm completely wrong for it. Why? What kind of a part is it? A woman. <laughs> not only if I known Sandy, I've been Sandy. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Why am I even going to this? Why am I even studying these lines? They're not going to gas me. Why am I even memorizing this bullshit? Why am I taking off of work or sneaking out of work? It's a waste of time. I'm not going to get cast. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, statistically, she's right. Yeah, she is right. Like you said. You are not going to get cast. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the keys to being content with your plight as an actor mm -hmm. is to, there, there's a, I, I'm sure I've said this samurai quote. The samurai idea is that you have to go into a battle already imagining your death that mm -hmm. you feel the sword cut that kills you so that you assume i'm already dead and that way when you go into battle you can act totally freely yeah i think part of the key of being an act you have to just go i'm not going to get it it doesn't yeah. matter and just walk in not caring you know mm -hmm. um but we go to him coaching her in acting and it's one of those scenes where she has to be really angry and strong, and she is not angry enough. You're wrong, Dr. Brewster. I'm very proud of being a woman. All right, Sandy, wait a minute now. This guy treats you like dirt because you're a woman and he's a big doctor, right? But you don't have to take that. You can talk to him on his level. Show me what you mean. And then he does the lines. You're wrong, Dr. What are you doing, a Southern accent? You're wrong, Dr. Brewster. I'm very proud of being a woman. See, I can't do it as good as you. Yes, you can. Just turn the tables on him. Come on now, will you? Yeah, I love that she says, you know, he asked what she's playing. She says, I'm playing rage. I'm enraged. This is rage? I have a problem with anger. Yeah, you certainly do. But I'll tell you something. There's a hundred other actresses reading for this part who don't have a problem with anger, who aren't afraid of working, who aren't afraid to stick everything out on the line and do it. Well, don't get mad at me. Well, stop being a doormat then. I'm not a doormat. Act right now. Do it. Have you ever had this where an acting coach personally goads you to get a reaction out of you oh yeah sure of course yeah standard operating procedure in a class and how do you feel about that well if they're right i appreciate it um but i also think a lot of teachers don't really understand how to do that responsibly because you can unlock something and if you don't have the way to walk that actor back from what you've unlocked you can really damage them uh, and that happens in acting classes all the time, um, regardless of what these teachers will fucking tell you. It happens all the time. So when it has worked and they've actually shown me something, I've always been appreciative. When it hasn't worked and we couldn't get there, I've always been angry at them for even for even thinking that they could um, and then quitting and giving up on it, which frustrates the piss out of me. You know? Yeah. That, that's kind of how, I, in general, I believe, like, I want a supportive environment where people yeah. are kind and you're a professional and we're supporting you to do your profession. I don't, the fucking with people kind of stuff is not something I like. Yeah. I, but I can't, again, it's like, I can't argue with success sometimes. And sometimes the actor will say, hey, that's what I needed right. to, to get to that place. But my, part of my issue is there are no qualifications for being an acting coach. And right. some, there are a lot of fucking tin plated dictators mm -hmm. who don't know what the fuck they're doing and feel like their job is to fuck with people. You know, it's the same thing on the directing side, you know? Yeah. There's, there's no qualifications to be a director. Really? No, you know, none. It's just, there's not, you don't have to, just, if they hire you, you're the director. That's it. You know? <laughs> it's so funny. The, the, the never finished directing book, there is a whole section on it, just what you just said. There are literally no qualifications. Like, Warner Brothers could go to a high school and just pick out a random person to direct their next superhero movie. Yeah. And it and might be worse. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, Michael Giacchino is about to direct Werewolf at Night. Michael Giacchino is a composer. Yeah. And they've asked him to direct this, this uh, no, uh, I mean, series or, or film. Yeah. 
Th sure. This is literally what that chapter of the book is about. Is like these people came from being editors and these people were screen. And you could show up on a set having never to direct your movie, having never set foot on a set. Yeah. yeah. But also what's happening in the scene here is, is two friends who are actors. And that's, yeah, that's a little more comfortable because she's opened the door for his help. She said she wants his help. And so he's helping her, but he's, and he's getting her there and he's actually really good at getting her there, which is, a, yep. it's, it's a nice scene that kind of um, lays a little more groundwork for their friendship. Cause we're just discovering their friendship as viewers, even though they've been friends for six years it's a nice little back and forth with them. But, and I've done that. And I've had friends who have worked with me on things that yeah. really gotten me into good places too. So, Well, and, and to be clear, this is what she wants. Yes. Absolutely. This is what she wants from him. And he says, Act right now. Do it. You're wrong, Dr. Brewster. I am. And apparently Terry Gar really did mess up her lines here. <laughs> and that's why he comes at her again. And then she goes, because she's a good actor, she goes right. They both go right with that moment of her messing up the line. You're wrong, Dr. Brewster. What do I have to do, hit you with a stick? You're wrong, Dr. Brewster. I am very proud to be a woman, and I'm proud of this hospital. And before I see yeah. it destroyed by your petty tyrannies. Have the anger, don't show it to me. Don't I'll push. I'll recommend to the board that you be thrown out into the street. Don't lose it now. Good day, Dr. Brewster. Don't whine like you're a second-rate actress. I said good day. And she does it pretty well, yeah. and I love her line. Did you feel how much I hated you? Which she's thrilled with how much she hated him in that moment. Yeah. This is deceptively a, could have been just a scene that establishes the friendship a little bit more for the audience, like I said earlier. But this whole thing is what launches this uh, situation in Michael's life. Yep. The fact that he has to walk her home because she doesn't have money for cab. She has this audition. He reads this, he helps her with this audition and you see him previewing the Dorothy voice. Yep. Uh, and then the goes to the audition. We're about to see the scene. And then later and confronts Sidney Pollack in his office. And so all of this happens because uh, Terry Gar doesn't have money for a cab fare and walks with Michael to her apartment. So it's just fascinating. It's a very innocent scene that leads to all of this happening. I and I love the button too. How am I going to get it back tomorrow? How am I going to get a total stranger to enrage me? All right, I'll pick you up at ten o'clock and enrage you. <laughs> so we go to the audition, and there's you know there's people with scripts, and um, you know she checks in, and I love her first reaction where she sees the other people in the room and goes, "Is this what it's supposed to look like?" That is what you look like. It's not funny, Michael. That's good. Keep that. Don't lose that anger. <laughs> we briefly see uh, Dabney Coleman and Jessica Lang. Um, Dabney Coleman was originally hired to play the agent. Oh, wow. Um, Dabney Coleman's an old buddy of Sidney Pollock. I think they kind of came up together, really like each other, hired him to be the agent. And then later on had to call him up and said, you're not going to play the agent. <laughs> it's like, all right, who have they replaced me with? <laughs> you're going to play another sexist just like you did in nine to five. Exactly. <laughs> um, and he goes, uh, she says, okay, wish me luck. And his way of wishing her luck is to say, fuck you. Thank you. Fuck you. Thank you. Go. God bless you. Yeah. And literally seconds later, she's coming back out. Yeah. I didn't get it. What? They wouldn't even let me read. What do you mean they wouldn't let you read? I mean, they wouldn't even let me read. They said I wasn't right physically, that they wanted somebody tougher or something. I don't know. So I'm going home. Okay, I'll walk you. To San Diego? And man, you know, having basically gone home to San Diego myself, <laughs> and you have literally gone home to San Diego to leave this industry. <laughs> it yeah. makes perfect sense. Uh, is, yeah. <laughs> and he is insistent that he's going to get her to read. He goes to the front desk, asks if Terry Bishop is here. And by the way, there are deleted scenes where we find out Terry Bishop, I think was his old roommate and was an actor that he knew and was they were close friends. Terry Bishop working here today. Uh, no, he's no longer with the show. Mr. Bishop is rehearsing the Iceman Comet for Broadway. He's what? And at this moment, all thought of helping Sandy out is yeah. gone. Yeah. Because he's a selfish son of a bitch. <laughs> yep. In that moment, he's like, what? The, the reaction is so strong. <laughs> That's my part. That was my part. Yep. And, uh, <laughs> and, he, says, and he says, don't, don't right do right anything right. rash. I'll be back. <laughs> Does and he I, ever come back? Well, I, no. And I love the button that Ter that uh, uh, she says. Terry Gar says, um, "Will he be back?" Is it really, <laughs> like, like she knows he's not coming back? It's he's correct. not coming back. So one of the big things that Sidney Pollock brought was yeah. he said, "Look, 
we have to make Michael desperate enough to put on the dress. Right. In some like it hot, there were machine guns that made them put on a dress. Right. And yeah. so a lot of this is setting up that desperation. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, uh, and this is just a classic screenwriting conundrum, is the, the problem with the first act is always, how do I get all the information out and get to where it's exciting as quickly as possible? And the exciting moment is him dressing up as a woman. So anything that doesn't get us there quickly, we have to take out. Yeah. So he runs down the street. He enters CAA, which really was their agents, uh, <laughs> right. asks if George Fields is in. And the receptionist is like, yeah, he's busy. You can't go in there. He barges in on the office and there is Sidney Pollack. Yeah. So this is what was happening is they're developing the script. Sidney and Dustin are arguing every day. And Dustin literally goes, look at us arguing. Look at how good we are at arguing with each other. You have to play the agent. And Sydney's like, no way. First of all, I haven't acted in 20 years. I'm a director. I can't direct this movie and act in it. And I've cast Dabney Coleman. He's fantastic. He'll be great. And this went on for month after month. And Dustin Hoffman is sending him a dozen roses every day with a card that says, please be my agent. Love, Dorothy. <laughs> And finally, it sounds like he was threatening to walk off the picture if Sidney wow. Pollock didn't play the agent. And finally, he said, okay, I'll do it. And they're great together. Yeah. Oh, my God. First of all, yeah. never storm in on your agent. Let's put that. That's, that's a Hollywood thing. Black, would you wait outside, please? I'm talking to the coast. This is a coast, too, George. New York is a coast, too. The back and forth is so awesome because this is not the first time this has happened. Nope. And the scene is written so well, too. Once again, a great example of how tight the script is. It is not immediately, Michael, no one wants to hire you. It is a slow transition that builds to that moment where he says, oh, no, 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 you're thinking too small. No <laughs> one wants to fucking hire you on any coast uh, for a radio. You think you can default to what you think are these like lesser situations. Even the lesser situations don't want to hire you. That's how bad your reputation is right now. So, so in a way, although machine guns are used in some like it hot, he's essentially using a machine gun. Yeah. Uh, in the in a in a figurative way here, saying your career is over, son. Over. Yeah. You know. It, what's interesting too is I I'm thrilled that this be begins Sidney Pollock's acting career. Yeah. Because he is always a super solid supporting actor mm -hmm. whenever he showed up anywhere. Um. And what's interesting to me is normally I think of him as solid. Like he is kind of a really just natural. Yeah. And what's so great is how Dustin Hoffman continually throws him. Yeah. Like he's to continually off balance and trying to talk to him. And I, by the way, and I totally agree with you. There is no way Michael Dorsey still has representation treating his agent this way. Oh yeah. yeah. There's no, he's not making, he's not making George any money. Yeah, yeah. Like you can't barge into my office and yell at me and go off and ruin gigs on commercials and stuff. No, you're out. I'm du I'm dumping you. Harry Bishop is on a soap opera. Millions of people watch him every day. He's known. And that qualifies him to ruin Iceman Cometh? <laughs> <laughs> Which to me sounds like a Larry Gobart line. I know this is going to disgust you, Michael, but a lot of people are in this business to make money. Well, don't really make it like I'm some money. flake, George. I am in this business to make money too. Really? Yes. The Harlem Theater for the Blind, Strindberg in the Park, the People's Workshop in Syracuse. Okay, now wait a minute. And he's like, look, I got good reviews at the People's Workshop in Syracuse. <laughs> not that that's why I did it. Well, of course not. God forbid you should lose your standing as a cult failure. <laughs> Such a great comeback, man. Oh, this one yeah. stabbed me in the heart, This ex these exchanges. <laughs> Just, <laughs> uh, having you know, done some shitty theater, Steve, that you come yep. to see, it is, yeah. uh, it is a rough situation. Lose your standing as a cult failure is like, because that like for me like standing by some uh, standing totally alone by some principle when nobody is paying any attention whatsoever yeah how it's does, like, what does that really mean oh and and then this is the first we sort of hear about this play that jeff has written nobody's gonna do that play why because it's a downer that's why because oh. nobody wants to produce a play about a couple that moved back to love canal but that actually happened who gives a shit nobody wants to pay 20 dollars to watch people living next to chemical waste they can see that in new jersey Jersey's always there as a punchline, isn't it? It's always there. Just always there. <laughs> Which, by the way, and it's so having now, you know, married someone who's from New Jersey, spent a lot of time. <laughs> New Jersey's beautiful. And not only is New Jersey's beautiful, and I don't have statistics on this, but there seems to be a really disproportionate number of talent, super talented actors, singers, comedians. Like Jersey yeah. is amazing, you know? Very true. 
but always there for a joke. And we hear he's going to raise the eight grand to do this. He says, I'm going to raise the $8,000 myself so I can produce his play. And I want you to send me up for anything. I don't care what it is. I will do dog commercials on television. I will do radio voiceovers. And this is where we get to what you were talking about. Michael, I can't put you up for any of that. Why not? Because no one will hire you. Oh, that's not true, man. I bust my ass to get a part right. And you know I do. Yes, and you bust everybody else's ass, too. And this is where we hear about the repercussions of the Tolstoy argument. Are you saying that nobody in New York will work with me? Oh, no, that's too limiting. Nobody in Hollywood wants to work with you either. And, and this is my note here was like, this agent is way too nice to Michael. <laughs> you play the tomato for 30 seconds. They want a half a day over schedule because you wouldn't sit down. Yes, it wasn't logical. I'm going to say it again. It's the problem with comedies is like, now I just won't have to play this because it's yeah, so yeah. funny. You were a tomato! A tomato doesn't have logic. A tomato can't move. That's what I said. So if he can't move, how's he going to sit down, George? <laughs> and City Pollock's just face and hands look of exasper of pained exasperation about Michael. And this is, it's so funny. Having Dustin Hoffman, an intensely passionate actor, mm -hmm. deliver this monologue or little speech in, with intense passion is so damn funny. And this is part of what Sidney Pollack did, is he said, I don't know how to direct comedy. I only know how to do drama. The way we're going to do this is everything is just 100% serious. Nobody plays anything for a laugh. And so when Dustin Hoffman says this thing, he is, there is no irony in it. He mm -hmm. says, I was a stand-up tomato, a juicy, sexy beefsteak tomato. Nobody does vegetables like me. I did an evening of vegetables off Broadway. I did the best tomato, the best what? cucumber. I, I did know. an on-deep salad that knocked the critics on their ass. <laughs> My note here is, this is amazing. <laughs> and you watch, you watch George, the agent, just crumbling in front of all this. Michael, I, I'm trying to stay calm here. You uh, are a wonderful actor. Thank you. But you're too much trouble. Get some therapy. Okay, thanks. I'm going to raise $8,000, and I'm going to do Jeff's play. Michael? You're not going to raise 25 cents. No one will hire you. Oh, yeah? And that's the machine gun. Yeah. You know? Right. And then here's the other thing, is that logically, this is what Sidney Pollack says, logically, what you would do now is do the montage where Michael turns into a woman. Yeah. You'd do the makeup, you'd have him shopping for dresses, you'd have him working on his voice, on how he walks, on a, you know, and fig you do the whole Pygmalion transformation. Yep. And what Sidney Pollack said, again, this is act one problems. We need to get to him in the dress as soon as possible. So he went, they took all that montage stuff out of the script at this point and said, we'll just do that later. Because now you get to cut from, oh yeah, to this unbelievable shot of a long lens looking through a crowd walking through new york city and slowly but surely emerges dorothy and you see her for the first time yeah and, and the score here well i want to look up the score of the composer because like the score here by dave grusin is fantastic you know it's this for those of us that grew up in the 80s there are certain scores or certain moments certain scenes that are underscored here by the music that just deliver. And this is one of those scenes because boom, the transition, as you said, Steve, you could easily have done, oh, showing him putting on the makeup, blah, blah, blah. But no, the transition, boom, is right there. And so you're like, oh, wow. And then you pick her out and you're like, because you've seen the poster or whatever. And you're like, oh my God. And just, no one's batting an eye. Everyone thinks she's a woman and it's perfect. Yep. Oh my God, it's perfect. So I said that there was, they did an early screen test and he wasn't very attractive. This process was not easy <laughs> to get him to look like this. Yeah. It took months and months of ex experimentation. The first thing was just how to get Dustin Hoffman, who has a fairly heavy, dark beard, to have a close shave. Yeah. And, and finally, they figured out that he had to shave in the sauna. They had to get his whole body super hot and then shave, and that was the cleanest shave they could give him. He has, always wears high collars to cover up the Adam's apple. Um, he has the glasses to cover up the long forehead, so it, it shortens his long forehead. Yes. His face is pulled up and back. His eyebrows pulled up and back. It's three-plus hours of makeup. By the way, one of the conversation, and this is why making movies is weird, is how big should this guy's boobs be? You know, and so they experimented with A cups and B cups and D cups and like <laughs> trying to figure that out till they finally came up with what the correct one was. And then, of course, how he moved, how he walked. And it, it, it literally was like a three year process mm -hmm. to get to Dorothy. 
And here are the couple of the signs as they're doing screen tests because they filmed it. Is at one point the projectionist said, oh, Who is that actress? And that's when Dustin Hoffman turns to Sidney Pollock. It's like, Okay. And what if Pollock was like, Just ask who that actress is? We just <laughs> in front of him. Oh my God. I never had that thought, but now I'm convinced that you are totally right. Of, of course, course, that's what he did. You're a director. You know, you got to get them in the fucking, uh, just, let's go. Let's go. Enough already. Yes. You have to accept that this is a, totally, totally. <laughs> and of course, there's a little stumble as he's walking, shows oh. up at the audition, gets introduced to Ron, who is Dabney Coleman. Yeah. By the way, Dabney Coleman's uh, wardrobe is mm -hmm. basically the way Sidney Pollock dresses. Sidney Pollock is a pretty fashionable dresser. Oh. And Dabney, is, who's buddies with Sidney, was like, this is like your clothes. He's like, yeah. And he goes, okay, I'm just going to play this part like I'm you. <laughs> and so that's how he played the part. Smart man. And she goes up for her audition, and Ron says, I'm afraid you're not right for this role. I'm sorry. Goodbye. <laughs> which and is what happened to Terry Gore, which is what happened exactly. to Sandy. So, yes. Yep. Why am I not right, Mr. Carlisle? I really like Dustin Hoffman's choice of voice. Dude, Dorothy Michaels is one of my favorite characters in the history of film, man. Mr. Carl, I, I'm an actress. I'm a character actress. I can play this part any way you want. Honey, I'm sure that you're a very, you very good actress. It's just that you're a little bit too soft what? and genteel. What's funny about this is this is exactly what he did in yes. auditions as a man. Yes. You're not threatening enough. Not threatening enough? How's this? You take your hands off me, or I'm going to knit your balls right through the roof of your mouth. He's had enough of a threat. And she even does a little faint with it. Yeah. And now everyone who wasn't really paying a ton of attention before is paying attention. You want some gross caricature of a woman to prove some idiotic point, like, like power makes women masculine or masculine women are ugly? Well, shame on the woman that lets you do that, on any woman that lets you do that. And that means you, dear. Miss Marshall, shame on you, you macho shithead. There is a weird element of a man has to come along to speak truth to power. You know? Yeah, and and certainly we uh, recently I've seen some uh, female writers criticize the movie for that. Yep. Um, you know, but I don't know. It's weird, and that's not you know. And these are female writers that weren't around in 1982. You know, I mean, like it was a different time. And, and I'm not saying that like, oh, you know, we used the N word. It was a different time. I'm saying the the approach mentally. Um, it was a very very male dominated uh industry and it still is of course uh but that's changing hopefully um but like so this film in a way was a way of showing this um as effectively as you could on the heels of nine to five i mean nine to five really opened a lot of people's eyes oh, and yeah. some men really hated that movie did not want that movie out there certainly a lot of christian activists fall well all them like bitched about it um and then here comes tootsie which is a little more palatable for guys to consume but the overall message is still the same i would argue how did there was no feminist talk from michael ever until this moment happened so where did right. he achieve this new level of feminism the same guy who was trying to hit on every woman at the party uh you know all of that where was that feminism before i think that's a valid criticism to be honest with you because he seems to have this idea right there at his fingertips um, and able to go back quickly, which is a great scene. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, we see nothing in the past of Michael to make us believe that he so, had this pro feminist point of view. So let me. So I want to get to that point in yeah. a moment. I want to go back to the earlier point, which is like I feel like after now six years of the cinephiles, I think we can make a statement clearly, which is that yeah. there are movies that are groundbreaking for their time. Yes. And that, you know, having just done, like, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, or like years ago when we did The Breakfast Club, is that to present a female character the way that John Hughes did, yeah. with really multiple dimensions, the way he did in The Breakfast Club, or even in Sixteen Candles, which has its own set of problems, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that is a move forward. And are there abusive things about The Breakfast Club that looking at now we go, oh, I don't really like that. Yes. Yeah. And that's, it's that, that, like, this is moving for when it was, this is yeah. absolutely groundbreaking. And for where we are, it's less so or different. The other thing about it is I actually think this movie is in a weird way, Dances with Wolves, Avatar, Last Samurai structure, where a troubled person enters into a different society and by being that other thing does things and they become a hero to that society. You know what I mean? And those are all problematic because even not that they're not good movies, but they all have the same issue of like, why do we need a white guy to come in and solve yeah. the problem of this other group? And it's like, well, because that's 
Yeah, because that's how we were able to do it then. Yeah, we yeah, wouldn't yeah. do it that way today. The and other that's thing, why just it, it, it rightfully gets called out today. That's why the white savior complex, white male straight savior complex, rightfully gets called out today. Sorry. I, no, I 100% agree, and it should be called out, but that doesn't mean we should throw out guess who's coming to dinner or throw out, you know, the, not that that's not white savior complex. Although, actually, that kind of is, too. That is white savior complex because Spencer Tracy comes and makes the speech that makes everything okay. Right. He's the one that makes it all okay, yeah. But in 1967, that movie needed to exist yeah. and move the ball forward. The other thing, and this is just something I want to contemplate as we go along in terms of, you mentioned Michael's ability to give this sort of feminist speech. I actually think there is a magic to acting and there's a magic to when you start playing this other person, you good actors automatically see things from their perspectives. That's a good point. You start to assume the mentality. And you know, we do see later on when he is talking to uh, um, Jeff there in the apartment, Bill Murray's character, when he's teasing the hair, talking about wanting to get her softer hair, more feminine. And he says, I'm, she's a better person than I am. Dorothy, yeah. Dorothy is a better. So in a way, this character is coming out of something in him and he is connecting to the character and therefore maybe able to deliver these kind of strong feminist speeches and strong feminist moments, as you say, because he is living the life of the character, which is what every acting coach worth their salt tells you to do is to live the life, the organic life of the character. Well, and this is the... It was interesting watching like behind the scenes things and stuff like that. There's interviews with Dustin Hoffman. I, my guess is they're from the late 90s because that's mm. about how old he looked, but I'm not sure. He was still weeping in telling stories yeah. about this movie is that Dustin Hoffman is a person who just feels he can't not emotionally put himself in a certain place. Right, right. You know what I mean? And there's a magic to that. Like that's the magic of acting is that you're suddenly experiencing new stuff. Yeah. So he storms out, he ends up at the elevator, and we hear Miss Michaels, wait a minute. And there is the producer of the show, whose character is Rita Marshall, played by Doris Bilak, who is was a soap opera uh, actor, tons and tons of stage, tons and tons of TV. She adds such a solidity, I think, to the, the people at the soap opera. Was that for real in there, or were you auditioning for the part? Quick chance you'll get me a reading, Miss Marshall. Well, good for you. Well, good for you. I love the way she delivers. Well, good for you. Like, all right, girl. You know, I love that moment. And we go back to the set. And what uh, Miss Marshall says to Dabney is. She told me no director had ever communicated a part to her so fast. Which is a lie. Which is a lie. Yeah. Rita is stroking his ego. So he look because she wants him to get the, or she wants her to get the part. Yeah. Yeah. And as Dorothy's stepping onto the set, she bumps into something, drops her script, and there is Jessica Lang, who comes to help. Beautiful. She is just, uh, there's an incredible natural beauty with Jessica Lang. Yeah. Um, also someone and, known for being, uh, you know, tough on sets as well, and battling with directors. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> just think of them as something friendly, huh? like a firing squad. <laughs> as the cameras move in. Let me have a right profile, camera one. Camera three, give me a left profile. And there's some confusion, which came from Dustin Hoffman. Dustin Hoffman was actually genuinely confused <laughs> about which left or right there was. Which way for your left? What? Is that my left or your left? Wait, wait a minute. What are you talking about? My left? Your left. And this is where we get... I'd like to make her look a little more attractive. How far can you pull back? How do you feel about Cleveland? <laughs> <laughs> that... Can you imagine, like, I don't know if that cameraman had more than one line in this movie. Delivered it perfectly. Perfectly. I mean, this is, it's not quite I'll have what she's having. Yeah. But it is like a memorable, like, for the rest of his life, he said that line. Ugh. And then we get the audition. I know the kind of woman you are, Emily. You're getting older, you've never been married, you don't have a man, so you want to act like one. All right, just shut your mouth right now. When you talk to me, you talk to me professionally. You don't get personal. And you see the reaction go around the set. I'm very proud of being a woman, Dr. Brewster. I'm very proud of this hospital, and you should be too. By the way, what was going on here was Sidney Pollack was off camera doing to Dustin Hoffman what it sounds like what Dustin Hoffman did to Sandy in the scene, is oh. that he was trying to piss him off. <laughs> he made it do him over and over again. He belittled and insulted him. He kept wow. saying, Dustin, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't understand what you're saying. Wow. Until Dustin Hoffman got really, and what they said, what he said 
was what was tough for Dustin Hoffman was to get really angry, but not get really masculine. Mm -hmm. And that was the balance they were really trying to find. Wow. And I must tell you, I'm going to recommend to the board that you be turned out into the street. A good day, Dr. Brewster. I said good day, sir. What is, uh, now I, I always think of the origins of I said good day as Willy Wonka. But now I, it's, I really wonder what is the actual origins of oh, I, the. I've never, so I, I didn't see Willy Wonka until oh, we did it for the. Until we did it for the show. Yeah, right? so I'd known Good Day for a long time. I've always thought that it was like an old, uh, old-timey saying, like back from the 1940s in the noirs or in, uh, sorry, not in the noirs, in the. Uh, like the, uh, the screwball, screwball. Yeah, screwball comedies. comedies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, good well, Day. now we have a we have a cadre of cinephiles out there maybe because someone yeah. can find the actual first usage of the i said good day <laughs> well, i don't know i mean it's your decision but there's something about it that bothers me does it bother you i like it she could argue that dabney is the first one that kind of senses that she's a man yeah or something's off yeah right absolutely and we have some fun music and we're outside the russian tea room and there is Sidney pollock and there is Dorothy who says, me? I wonder if you can help me. I'm looking for the Russian tea room. And here's what Sidney Pollock's direction to himself is. You think you're on candid camera. <laughs> this is the Russian tea room. Right here. You're, you're standing in front of me. Oh, well, my star, so it is. Here was another makeup test. And now you have me wondering if this was a setup as well, because they want Dustin's like, okay, we did the screen test. Now we need to go around town with me as dorothy and see if people react to me as a woman yeah and so one of the places they went to was the russian tea room yeah yeah and there in the russian tea room having dinner is john voight <laughs> who dustin hoffman had acted with in midnight cowboy right and he goes up to john voight and introduces himself as dorothy and gets an autograph and john voight just signed the autograph <laughs> didn't recognize dustin hoffman at all george sits down and then Dorothy comes and sits next to him. Wait, 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 wait. wait. I'm new in town and I'm awfully lonely. I wondered if you wouldn't mind buying me lunch. Wait, wait, hold on. You can't come. Oh. Gregory, this will... Stop! Ah. And Dustin Hoffman says that he grabbed him by the balls under the table in this movie. It moment. certainly sounds like it because the cough yeah. that Sidney does to cover it is so perfect because he was going to yell. He yep. coughs instead. And, he, and I love Dustin's going, it's Michael Dorsey. It's my, your favorite client. <laughs> you know, the voice yeah. going up and down. George, 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 George. It's Michael Dorsey, okay? Your favorite client. How are you? And George is just going, no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> Every time the two of them are in a seat together, I love it. It is. It is great. I mean, because the last time George saw him, he told him to get therapy, and now he's dressed up as a woman. So yeah. this is a total mind fuck for George. He's like, what is happening? God, I beg you to get some therapy. I know, and you also told me that no one would ever hire me again. Jesus Christ, do you think this is going to make a difference? I got a soap, George. I love the waiter comes up, and, and George orders a double vodka. For the lady? Oh, <clears throat> how about a uh, Dubonnet with a twist? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. That's a lovely blouse. Thank you. Welcome. And some producers come up, and he introduces himself as Dorothy Michaels. Actual producers, by the way. The smaller guy is Ronald R. Schwari, who produced oh. Ordinary People. Mm. Uh, yeah, so, and he, well-known producer. He did Soldier Story. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, Meet Joe Black, Scent of a Woman. Um, wow. And the last thing he did was producing the TV show Medium for its entire run with uh, Patricia Arquette in the lead. So he was an actual producer. So the kind of awkwardness you see is somewhat authentic because he only acted in like eight things and Sidney pollock just you know treading water trying to keep up with <laughs> what the hell is going on in the scene which has to be improv right because he is just totally fucking with him and it's so natural his reactions of uncomfortability and trying to maintain some level of decorum is so good well and this is why dustin hoffman was a hundred percent right to force Sidney Paul because this is all they did every for a year and a half leading up to this. And every day on the set is Dustin Hoffman coming like, I want to do this. I want to, how about if we do this? Let's throw out that. And Sidney Paul coming to go, no, 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 no. Hold on. Hold on. Wait, wait, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. Don't, 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 just don't get close to me. I want you to owe me a thousand dollars to pay me. For what? For what? For what? I got to have something to wear besides this. <laughs> And now is when we do the montage that we didn't do, you know, so we see him buying clothes, we see him hailing a taxi, and this is uh, so good. 
and this is a classic Sidney Pollock, Dustin Hoffman thing, which is Sidney Pollock went, it was his idea to say, I want you to hail a cab and a man will steal the cab. <laughs> and Dustin Hoffman said, well, I want to reach in and pull the man out. And because I'm a man myself, I'm strong enough to pull the guy out of the cab. And Sidney Pollock with no way, no, that ruins the joke, takes the joke too far. And so what their deal was always was, we're going to get it my way first, and then you can have a freebie. And so, and of course, in this case, the freebie stays in the movie, which yeah. is Dustin Hoffman's idea. You got to love that actor who plays it so well. Throwing yep. around. Yep. Uh, we're, we're in the apartment with Jeff, and, and we hear Dustin, this is his first talking about what life as a woman is like. He says, those women were like animals. I saw this one beautiful hammock that was on sale, but I was too frightened to fight for it. I mean, they're vicious. They kill their own. The woman that finally bought this handbag, I know did time. <laughs> See this laundry? You know what it costs? And the makeup? I don't know how a woman could keep herself attractive and not starve these days. Which, first of all, we had the Sandy line where she talked about always having to buy glasses and things yeah. like that. There was a thing I just heard, and I saw some podcast, I don't remember which one, that was talking about how much more expensive basic things are for a woman than for a man. Yeah. And it's, oh, yeah. And it's small things, but it's like, women's deodorant costs a dollar 50 more than men's deodorant yeah women's shoes cost more women's socks cost more hair products every single thing is 20 30 40 50 percent more expensive and they need more of them you know and so and it was just something like you talk about you know pay inequity so a woman makes 76 cents on the dollar for a man and every single thing article of clothing cosmetics medical things all of them cost 20 to 30 percent more than what we have to pay for you know what my real problem is, though? Cramps. Sandy. Sandy. I want to tell her they cast a man instead of her. She gets suicidal at a birthday party. Don't tell her. What am I going to do? <laughs> tell her somebody died and left it to me? Cut to. Oh, my God. When did she die? Last night. Of what? A disease. Gee, what a coincidence. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're needing $8,000 and her dying and leaving you exactly that much. Is it not? He hands her the script to the Love Canal play that now they can do. And he asks her out to dinner and she's super excited. And she says, I'll jump in the shower. And he's alone. And the first thing he does is there's a full length mirror that he checks out his body and his butt in it. And then he's in his bedroom. And he starts looking through her clothes. I think this is the weakest sort of setup okay. in the movie. I don't believe that he would really just start putting on one of her dresses that's, I yeah. mean, it's real dumb. Especially when she's, and how quick was that shower too? I mean, for God's sake, so. That is a quick, that, it definitely is a quick shower. He's got his clothes off. He's in his underwear. He's dropped his pants to his ankle. Yeah. And she walks out. Stay here if you want to. And, <gasps> what are you doing? Oh, God. And he says, Sandy, I want you. You want me? I want you. And he does the shuffle forward with both feet still in his pants walk to her. Now let's analyze this moment as we talk about literally going to say the yeah. same thing. <laughs> yeah. Let's analyze this. Cuz I mean please. He's essentially covering up what he's doing by s having sex with her. Yes. Did he ever want to have sex with her? I don't know. I would imagine possibly because he's hit on every other woman in the in the in the planet, but you know, there are people that maybe he did, didn't have feelings for, but in that moment this is what he does to cover up. So in a way, it's kind of not f feminist what he did here because he wasn't telling her the truth and then just used her for sex to try to cover up his lie. So it's a I mean, little he's bit He's not wrong. even using her for sex for sex. Right, for sex. You he's know? using her to cover up a lie. Exactly. He's willing to go to bed with her to cover up a lie. But it does lead to a fantastic back and forth that Sandy absolutely owns and Terry Gar is so perfect in the delivery. I think this is the one area where they both went for a joke and went for a plot point that yeah. doesn't actually sit perfectly with me character-wise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I think definitely. what he does here, I mean, like I said, he is a way more of a jerk than I had remembered him being. This yeah. one in particular is really fucked up. Yeah. Like saying, and because he knows how vulnerable Sandy is and right. going, I'm going to have sex with her to cover up my lie, right. knowing who she is. It's just, it's, it's, and I, I'm fine with him going, being, you know, Terry Gar is attractive and, right, right, right. you know, he's a guy that she's going to be attracted to her. Sure. Sure. The other side of this. Yeah. Right. The other side of this too, is that his perception of Sandy is of this meek person who's a, 
usually the nicest people have the strongest fucking spines because to be nice in this world is not easy and people are going to use you and you just keep believing in people and they're going to hurt you, but -hmm. you keep surviving. And there's a spine that comes with that. And so him devaluing her in that way, immediately before he goes over there, how she won't be able to take it or she couldn't possibly take it. It's, it's kind of a sexist point of view of, as a man to think, well, I'll just, you know, not tell her the truth and I'll just have sex with her, which is gratifying for him to a degree um, in order to not to, cause I'm afraid she's going to fall apart. Like I don't have enough belief in her strength that she's going to fall apart and it's bullshit. It's, it's a, uh, you're totally removing her agency as a woman in that, in that, uh, in that scene. Yeah. You know? yeah. And look, I know he, it's played for yeah. jokes. We're not trying to be overly serious, but if we're analyzing as we do on the ascentophology, you have to look at it from that direction as well. Well, and what Sidney Pollack said is like, I'm not playing this as a comedy. I'm doing this as a serious, mm. that, that, that's mm-hmm. how he directed the movie, you know? Um, it, and the thing is, is that she shows so much character in the next scene, which yes. is all, this is all Elaine May. We'll never see you again. What? Sandy, we've known each other for six years. I know. But sex changes things. I mean, I've had relationships where I know a guy and then I have sex with him. And then uh, I bump into him someplace and he acts like I loaned him money. That fucking line is so great. By the way, Terry Gard is a thing here that I've always meant to talk about. So I'm glad we have this show. Uh, but like her... L- lifting the cover yes. to look at her body when she's talking about sex. What is that all about? Is she making sure that she's clean? Is she making sure that, you know, um, that, uh, the, 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 I don't know what she's looking at, but it's fascinating. Is she admiring her own body and its ability to seduce men? I don't know, but it's an interesting moment where she just kind of peeks under the covers of her own body talking about sex and then looks back at him and says this whole thing about lending money, which is a fucking great line. So, so first of all, Terry Gar is a comic genius. I yes, believe. she is. Is that, and she is in a way, there's some, like, I understand, there are things that I understand that I couldn't do. I, I can't write as wittily as Larry Gelbart. It's not possible. Or I, I can't write funny things like Elaine May. There's all sorts of things I can't do. Yeah. But I, when I see them, I understand what they did. What Terry Gar does in that moment, I don't understand. Yeah. And it's brilliant. And my, my gut is it's kind of like, how attractive am I? Like, what did Michael like the sex enough that he's going to stay with me? That that's sort of how I feel about it. But it's yeah. it's funny when we did because Terry Gar shows up on Star Trek, so she's in uh, Assignment Earth, and Scott and I are talking about her. And there are little things that she does where you can see in 1968 the seeds of the genius she's going to become. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, where she just delivers a line in an odd way that only Terry Gar would do that is unique and funny. And what's interesting about the, you know, her g- questioning what this thing is, is that it drives him to commit more to a relationship than he should have. Yeah. You know, she gives him an out. She's like, look, is this just sex? And if so, just tell me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Michael, I know this pain in every relationship. I would just like to have my pain now, Okay. I mean, otherwise, I'll just wait by the phone. And then if you don't call, I'll have pain and wait by the phone. It's a waste of time. <laughs> Which is brilliant. She's trying to take control of the situation. Yeah, it's brilliant. It's brilliant. Let's just yeah. put it on the table, get it over yeah. with so it can move on. Yeah. I mean, if I'm going to have pain, let's have it now. I don't want to wait for pain. And she clearly uh, didn't go to San Diego. So she's tougher <laughs> than you think. So. Yep. And that's where he commits. He says, all right, let's make it definite. Dinner tomorrow. Mm-hmm. The treatment of Michael towards Sandy is so terrible. Yeah. And it's what's so interesting is he's on this journey. He literally just got apart by demanding that men respect him as a woman, a woman. Yeah. Yeah. And now he, we're going to watch him for the next act plus, you know, two acts of the movie disrespecting women. Yeah. Well, just right. Sandy for sure. Yeah. And, and yeah. And in a way disrespecting other women as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yep. That's a good point. Um, we have a hard cut to an alarm. And again, now we have more of the montage things that we hadn't seen before. We have him, putting on the eyebrows, shaving his legs, doing his makeup. He puts in false teeth. He puts on his lipstick. He works on the wig. Uh, he wakes up Jeff. Mom. <laughs> this whole scene is improvised. Say something. How you do, Jeff? It's nice to meet you. You look very nice. Nice. But the hair's not right. No, it's kind of high. You got kind of a hard jaunt thing going well, on. Well, do something. I can't be late my first day. Come on. He goes out. Again, we get another taxi joke. This one is he calls for a taxi as a woman. Taxi! And she goes 
into the studio. She meets the AD, who is Lynn Thickpen, who we'd seen in a million things. Yep. And then he walks into his dressing room, and there is Gina Davis changing. Which, you know, it's interesting because, in a way, it is objectifying her because she's in her panties and her in her bra yeah. panties. But on the other side of it is, well, that's how it would be in a dressing room with women because women is no big deal to them, right? So it's yeah. So it's a it's a funny situation, but certainly. It is a, a, I don't know, a, you know, a bit s- slightly sexist, I guess, because you've got to see the ball and panties. I'll, I, I agree. So, so for, particularly, so this is what Sidney Pollock describes. He f- says he just needed someone with the right kind of breasts for this scene. That's how he described casting this part, and that he saw her because she was a model. Yeah. And he saw her in some modeling photographs and said, that's who I want. And then was shocked at just how great an actress she is. Obviously, this is the beginning of a really great career. Yeah. The casting director, by the way, is Lynn Stallmaster, who is one of the great casting directors of all time. Yeah. And and obviously, this movie reflects it. The thing that's weird to me about the scene, and I, you know, I've done some small, you know, equity waiver theater. Or you've done mm-hmm. some of it. Yeah. If you do enough theater... You've been in dressing rooms, oh. or in, you know, yeah, co-ed ones. Yeah, you don't. You just it, it's about getting the clothes on and running out there and doing the scene. Yeah, it, it is. It's, so the fact that he can't handle this is not actually how Michael's seen this before, right? But he does some very funny sort of fumbling as he's like trying to deal with his new situation. It talks about you know the where the plug is and things like that. A table, a very strong table, <laughs> and he, that's when he starts to realize just how many. Uh, pages of scripts he has to learn every day and he also sees in the script that he has to kiss dr brewster oh yeah he kisses all the women on the show we call him the tongue great george Gates. and what's you know from talking to women who are actors this is not a not this is a real thing yeah oh yeah and what by the way city pollock said one of the weird things about putting this movie together is one of the things that they had to track was the actual plot of the soap opera Mm. not that it has to make perfect sense but they had to go like, okay, who are these characters and what is going on in this world? Yeah. And, and so we're sitting on the scene where there's this patient that needs to be helped up. And Julie, which is the Jessica Lang character, is there to help him up. And Dorothy is trying to get some direction because she, of course, has some issues with the script. <laughs> and in the midst of this, she gets introduced to the John Van Horn, which, as you say, is George Gaines. Yeah. Who is brilliant in this movie. Oh, my God. Yes. Hey, Michael. Yes. Yeah. I'm John Van Horn. We're up next. And sprays some banaca in his mouth. (laughs) And I love the awareness of Michael Dorsey to the guy who is about to kiss him. So, by the way, uh, Dabney Coleman did not think this movie was going to succeed. Wow. And the reason he didn't think it was going to succeed is he'd done tons of comedies. Obviously, he's a great comic actor. And he says, always on comedies, people are always cracking up on the set. And we just we just did Beverly Hills Cop, which had multiple stories of Eddie Murphy cracking people up and the director, you know, had to hide because he was laughing so hard. Dabney's no one laughed on this set (laughs) ever. It was all totally serious. And Dabney's like, this is not going to be funny. And again, it's because Sidney Pollack was like treated this like a drama. Yeah. Yeah. And it was only when he saw the screening that Dabney was like, oh, my God, this movie is hilarious because it's all in reaction shots and it's all, you know. It's all there, but he didn't see it when he was on the set. There's also just a, this is a great, small, perfect, small moment. Is someone asks Ron, Dabney Coleman's character, if he wants some food. And he says, give me a bagel and cream cheese. And then they ask Jessica Lang, which is Julie, do you want anything? Oh, no, 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 no. It's the reverse. He tells the guy. Barney, give me a bagel and cream cheese, will you? And the guy, out of courtesy, says. Julie, you want anything? No, no, she's she's fine, thanks. And completely removes her responding to the guy. You know, it's even more of a like totally. indication of how this guy sees his control in the world. To me, this is like the holy grail of screenwriting and filmmaking. If you could nail a relationship in one 14 second moment, right, and go, oh, I see it. I get, I get what's happening there. That is brilliant. And it took apparently nine writers or whatever, and years <laughs> and years. To get to the point where you could do those two lines. No, she's fine. That's and Jessica plays it really well with that small beat because you can see that she's yep. upset in, that he's done it. But the, what can she do? And then in the next moment, he's talking about how she's inflaming someone's desire and pats her butt and says, God knows it always inflames my desire. When she's on her knees is what he says. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Yes, you're right. She introduces herself to Dorothy and says, We met the other day, Julie Nichols, hospital slut. And I love, again, we get the first sort of John Van Horn 
uh, where they tell him he has to say something loudly. And he says, uh, will it be on the teleprompter loudly? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And who do I say that to? To Julie. What? <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> yeah, it's going great. There's no way the casting directors of Police Academy didn't see his performance here and go, oh, my God, this is perfect. He's the commandant. He's Oh, that's where he's from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't Bucky seen Brewster. a Police Academy movie in 30 years. Oh, my I God. Guess. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and Punky Brewster as well. So Ah, and we're starting the scene, and Dorothy in, enters, and I love that she helps Jessica up, and they flub a line so that J- Julie has to then drop and be helped up again to make it make sense. Dr. Brewster, you and I must talk. And they go out into the hallway. This is still part of the scene. You know, Emily, there's no reason for us to be in opposite camps. We can rule Southwest General together. I admire people with power. Women with power, especially. And she moves in, and here comes the big kiss. And what's so funny is Michael Dorsey does what apparently he's done throughout his career, which is not do what he's supposed to do. Right. He 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 doesn't sit down as a tomato. He doesn't get up and walk across the room when he's dying. And now, because he doesn't want to kiss this guy, even though it's in the script, she hits him on the head. Everyone reacts. I'm afraid, Dr. Booster, that you have underestimated me. If you want to win me over, you'll have to deal with my mind. And my lips. Cut it. And he and John says, I was supposed to kiss her. <laughs> Some wonders off. Now, it happened to be uh, a very good instinct to us, but the next time you want to change something, you discuss it with me first. Do you understand? Oh. Uh, yes, I was, I was wrong not to. Now, of course, she did try to discuss it with him first. Yeah. Right. And John Van Horn, who was supposed to kiss her, is now enthralled. Dorothy. Yes. I just want to say I loved what you did in our scene. Thank you. Welcome aboard. And she starts to talk to him, and he plants a big, huge kiss on her, and then walks away with the Bianca. And a, a grin on his face, like he got the best oh, yeah. of So in, in some deceptive way, he understood what she did, but he had to get her back. So, yeah. which was weird. So I was debating, trying to figure out where I would bring this up. Yeah. Uh, which is, we talked about how profoundly moved Dustin Hoffman was by seeing himself as a woman, being ignored as a woman, realizing he would ignore other people as a woman, and how intensely passionate he was about looking at the roles of women and how men treat women and learning about himself by becoming a woman. And that is all true. And that is the fuel that makes this movie good. Right. Dustin Hoffman has multiple Me Too accusations against him. He does. From this era, from 70s, from 80s, from both before and after this film. Right. Including things like what John Van Horn is doing. Yeah. Including things like what Dabney Coleman's character is doing. Groping, sexual harassment, and multiple accusations of assault, including from underage girls, women who claim that he, you know, did really really terrible stuff yeah yeah and i don't i don't know what to do with that with this movie i mean you know the movie is about the movie accomplishes its goal which is to show you um what life is like as a woman at least a slice of what life is like as a woman yeah in a male dominated world and in a way she's a feminist icon because she stands her ground both in front of and behind the camera and off the yes. camera. And so there's a, there's a strength in that. And I think that's what you take from it. And the other stuff is the other stuff. And uh, certainly Hoffman deserves to be raked over the coals. And there are moments in this movie, for example, the camera makes a point of catching Michael as Dorothy lowering his glasses so that he could see Jessica Lang's butt as she's walking away. Mm-hmm. That's sexist. It, it, you know, do men do that? Of course. And we yes. all do that because we want to admire, you know, if we're turned on by somebody, attract somebody, you want to kind of take them in. And yeah, we all do that. Um, does the camera have to show that? No. And it undercuts um, his supposedly feminist, new, dis, newly discovered feminist point of view. Well, except that um, he is a jerk for a long, I mean, part of what the movie is showing is him being a jerk almost up until the very end. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And that's yeah. what I'm saying is like, there's, yeah. there's these conflicting things that they have in this movie that uh, are and looking at it through 2022 eyes. Now it's different. Cause obviously when I watched it when I was a teenager, 
I didn't think twice about him checking out her butt because it's like, oh yeah, I was discovering women and discovering teenage girls because I was a teenager. And so yeah, you you cop your looks where you can because you just are so turned on by them. Uh, but the camera doesn't have to show that could have been a different shot. He could have been looking at her in a in a beautiful dress or looking at her in a different situation, admiring her beauty in a different way. But he admires her as a sexual object, and I think that's where the message gets a little confused. Um, whereas Michael is definitely this. Dorothy is that, but when Michael is dressed as Dorothy doing that, that's when the confusion comes in, in my opinion. Well, this is where, and we're, you know, we're into a strange new world and I continually go, well, how do we think about these things? Because guys do check out women. We are driven yes. by sex. We are attracted to attractiveness. Yeah. I can't think of a way I can show a dude checking out the, the basic way to show a dude checking out a woman is shot reverse shot. We see the person looking, we see what they're looking at. And I don't want to take a whole bunch of nature and say, hey, that all stuff is all real and exists, but I can't put that in a movie. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do that. But I also agree with you. But but, but but again, this is what this movie is. Michael is not a good guy. Exactly. When he's dressed, when he's Michael, him, low, him checking out a woman's butt, that mm. makes sense. When he's dressed as Dorothy, claiming that she's a better person than him, but then he takes that moment to lower his glasses, which is right. a standard old trope for decades to check out her butt he is violating dorothy and the character of dorothy by bringing michael into it and right. i think that's where the confusion lies mm. for me in certain moments in the movie because i'm like i don't understand why you would do that as a director now, look I, I who am i to, to contradict the great Sidney pollock but i don't understand why you would do that as a director surely nowadays i don't think you'd do that as a director you'd have a, you'd be a little more conscientious of it i think um it's Later, it's outside Julie signing autographs. She invites Michael to come to a drink with her and Ron. Yeah. And he says, you know, no. And watches as they get into a, a cab. And again, Ron is patting her ass as he gets into a cab. Michael walks away, pulling his, you know, underwear out of his butt. <laughs> Dustin Hoffman wanted to do that in like every shot. And Sidney Pollock was, you get to do it like twice. Yeah. Which again, I'm with Sidney Pollock on this one. You only do it so much. He's talking to Jeff, and this again proves why Elaine May was right that he had to have this roommate. She's really a very, very attractive girl. And she's no dummy either, but for the life of me, I cannot understand what she's doing hanging around with that director. He treats her like she's just uh, nothing. Which is how Michael has treated people. Yeah, certainly treating Sandy that way. He pushed me around today. I'm telling you, if I didn't have the dress on, I would have kicked his arrogant ass in. How'd you ever end up communicating with this guy? Well, he told me what he wanted. I didn't agree with him. I didn't say anything. I did it the way I wanted to. He bowled me out. I apologized to him. That was that. I think Dorothy's smarter than I am. But also, how many women like connect to this moment? Because I've heard women say this, like where they apologize even though they're in the right. They have yep. to apologize when a man gets upset at them, even though they were right, or tried to get that man's attention to explain something, and then the certain thing happens, and the man does say, oh, you were right. And then they apologize for even remotely, you know, contradicting yep. the man, even though they were right. So this is a thing that a number of women have spoken about. Certainly we heard more about it after the Me Too movement, how much more this idea of apologizing when they don't need to apologize, you know? Yeah. Well, and I love the juxtaposition of these two moments because she says from going, I think Dorothy's smarter than I am. The next mo thought she has is I just wish I looked prettier. Yeah. Maybe I can just get a softer hair or something because she, she deserves it. This is that the acting of this part is changing him. Yeah. Because yeah. you can't not see from that perspective. Right. Um, and then the phone rings and we get into this problem, which is neither of them can answer because she doesn't want anyone to think Dorothy is living with a man. She, If she answers it with a woman, Sandy's going to go, who is this woman at this place? And now he's talking to Sandy, pretending to be sick because he yeah. can't make it to the dinner. Yeah, well, I told you to give me the pain yesterday, Michael. I just don't have the energy. I think I have a virus. I didn't forget. I just may have the flu or something. And immediately, Sandy goes from angry to concerned. Oh, Michael, do you have a fever? I think so. How much? I don't know. Oh, my God. Well, go right to bed and take two aspirin and bundle up and sweat and drink plenty of liquids. And above all, take 1,000 units of vitamin C every hour with milk only. Because she's a really nice person. Yeah, she's a good person. We're back out at the studio. Again, Jessica Lange's character is being mobbed. And Dorothy walks away. And then one man comes up to get her autograph. And this is where this is sort of the little montage of her role is getting more appreciated, including we see like a receptionist who is secretly watching the TV while listening on an earphone. And we see more people 
getting autographs. And this is the first time we see Julie's father, which is Charles Durning, mm -hmm. who's so good in this movie. Yeah. And then we see a bunch of women. They're like playing Mahjong or something. And mm -hmm. Dorothy comes on the screen and all of them stop what they're doing to watch Dorothy. And we get, oh, this person's becoming the star. He's writing down that he has a new date with Sandy. It's Thursday at 830. And he's like, I'm not going to forget. Um, and Sandy goes out shopping for the date. We have another scene, and again, we have we see Dorothy being the the strong, powerful one with Dr. Van Horn. And now everyone on the set is sort of watching and can see that something important is going on. Look at me when I talk to you, Dr. Brewster. I don't trust a man who won't meet my eye. I don't trust it in a bank teller. I don't trust it in an insurance salesman. And I certainly don't trust it in a cheap surgeon. Poor Dr. Brewster is just trying to look at the lines and just trying to figure out, figure out where he is. Where he is. And she gra I love that she grabs him when he's looking at the teleprompter, te the teleprompter and says, Stop thinking of me as a woman, Medford, and start thinking of me as a person. That's what Southwick General is made of, people. And he just walks out confused. And, she, and the director goes, push in for a close-up. And then everyone. Not, Not too close. close. Okay, hold it there. And the more that Dorothy Michaels messes with John Van Horn, the more he likes it. It was wonderful the way you held my face. Oh. You controlled me completely. I felt your power. Well, thank you, John. But, you know, you had some great moments. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then we hear, and this is this is a ridiculous plant, but is important, which is that the dumb uh, engineering staff erased a reel of the show, and they either have to reshoot it right now or go live tomorrow. Uh, which, by the way, this never happens. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a thing there are no soap but they described like yeah there was this one time we had to go live and john van horn was totally freaked out because he can't remember his lines and it happens every once in a while and it's like no this doesn't happen soap operas don't actually have to go cut into a scene live but this is the plan because this is how they have to get to what's going to happen at the end of the the show yeah. and as dorothy is moving through the set she looks over and in a corner she sees ron who is dating julie kissing gina davis's character yeah and, and, and what's so funny and in the next and just in the next moment julie is asking him to come over which he is attracted to julie yeah and so is he any better than ron and exactly. this is the real question which is yeah and the movie does call him out at the end which i think is really oh yeah thankfully does it isn't brushed past you know it's really called out and as great as the movie is in the setup in the middle part where all this is happening, the ending is really fantastic uh, for sure. But yeah, he's getting into this situation with Julie. Then what's, we what we see him cut. Uh, don't we cut to where he's figuring out what to wear? And he's yeah. and, and Bill Murray's like, wear the white thing. He's like, you can't be overly dressed up. Like, I got to wear something nice that's going to impress her, even though he's going over as Dorothy Michaels, which is a weird kind of mentality here. But yeah, well, and, and even Bill Murray, I think, says it. Or Jeff says it like, you know, you're we're getting into a whole new area. <laughs> Weird area. Not uh, comfortable with. You know, this may seem silly to you, but this is our first day. We just want to look pretty for her. There's like 12 things weirder in that line. And by the way, this is probably Sidney Pollock's least favorite scene in the whole movie. And the oh. reason is, is because he feels it's jokey. I don't think he's wrong. Yeah. To be honest with you, I don't think it's necessary. But now, Michael Dorsey, who is attracted to Julie is going to head over, not dressed as a man, but dressed as Dorothy Michaels, to run lines with the person that he is attracted to. And so it's not just Michael Dorsey got a gig for a part, you know, to make some money to produce a Love Canal play. It's <laughs> Michael Dorsey, the human, actually having human interactions and emotions about this situation. Yeah. And I think, John, at this point, it's a good time to end part one of our exploration of Tootsie, I think there's been a lot here yeah. and I am certainly looking forward to digging into the rest of it, but I'm also looking forward to hearing all of our cinephiles out there, all of your thoughts. You can visit us on Facebook. You can go to Twitter where we're cine underscore files, cinephiles podcast on Instagram. Please subscribe to the show. If you haven't already subscribe at all the places, but most importantly, Apple podcasts, because, and we're, we'd love you to leave your reviews. You can rate the show on Spotify. You can leave comments on YouTube. You can buy or stream Tootsie along with every other movie we've ever reviewed on cinephiles.net. And you can support the show at patreon.com slash the cinephiles, where we clearly just on this episode came up with at least one and maybe a couple of other good conversations to have. And if you want to follow me, SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram and enterprise incidents for all your 
Star Trek needs. We are almost at the end of the original series. We're Ooh. close to halfway through season three. Um, and we definitely, definitely need to have John Roca back on before we get to the end. Um, so for sure. Yeah. John, where could people reach you? Uh, you can always find me at the Roca says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, the Outlaw Nation on Twitch and my YouTube channel, which is the Outlaw Nation, youtube.com slash John Roca says, and my other podcasts, the Geek Buddies and the Top Ten. They're out there for you to enjoy. Excellent. And I think that's it for this week. We will see you next time for part two of Tootsie on the Cinephiles. Mm-hmm.